Bruce Lee was a, a boxing fan, and he really liked boxing. And at that time, if you can remember that far, people were just doing karate, so it was point karate. And he didn't like that. He thought he enjoyed boxing matches better than karate matches at that time because it was point, and it would just take your point and then go back to the corner and then take the point. And he wanted something to flow. So what he did was, because he liked boxing so much, and as you know, he was, Bruce Lee was the boxing champion, high school boxing champion in Hong Kong. He put in the boxing movements of Western boxing, took the kicks from different Chinese systems, and southern, both southern and northern systems, and he started to play around with it. In the beginning, we wore a lot of armor, like we wore baseball shin guards, we were a body protector, we were face masks, you know, we were elbow pads, you know, we were boxing gloves, we experimented with boxing gloves, finger gloves, and nobody was doing it at that time period. The only people that were doing in the United States at that time period would, would probably be Bondo. Bondo is a, a Burmese, uh, Indian, Chinese, and Tibetan martial art. And the JKD people in Bondo, uh, people at that time were the only ones that were doing full contact karate. And this is how it evolved, you know. And then later on, we started taking away the shin guards, we started taking away the body protector, we started taking away the face mask, and then we just, to, all we used was the uh, boxing headgear. And that became kickboxing. At first, I coined the term Chinese kickboxing. He says, no, just call it Chinese boxing because Chinese boxing is what he wanted to be called. And then later on, we start using the word Chinese kickboxing and then kickboxing, or Jun Fan kickboxing. In the development of uh, Jun Fan kickboxing, Bruce, he researched a lot of different systems at that time, the known systems at that time. He would observe them. And the thing he liked about the Muay Thai was the rear leg power. He felt, though, that it, the front leg wasn't active enough at that time period. You have to look at the time period that he, uh, that he was in and why he, was, he made these things. A lot of it came from Don Drager's book. I don't know if you're aware of Don Bra Drager's book. You know? And he classified the ties as saying, well, the uppercut is non-existent. Of course, that's what Bruce Lee did his research. And at that time, a lot of ties didn't uppercut. And the reason why they don't uppercut is because the knee is in the same range. So the knee took care of the uppercut. He says, but he liked the elbows of the ties. He's, he said, well, that's a powerful tool. He didn't, in Don Drager's book, he mentions about the jab was uh, not seen very much, almost non-existent. Okay? And that's the reason why, because they foot jab with their foot. So you have to look at why he came to these, uh, this thinking at that time period. They said the hook was almost non-existent. And the reason why, on the tight hook, the ties used the elbow because the elbow was in range, in tight. They don't have to use the, the overhead because the, the tight hook is in the same range as the elbow. And the elbow will cut the face up more. It will, and it's more punishing than sometimes the left hook. And the kick... He referred to the Thai boxers uh, as the John L. Sullivan with the leg. Now, all this is true depending who you're watching at that time. But if you look at the Thai boxer now, they jab, they cross, they have good hands, supplemented with devastating knees, devastating elbows, devastating kicks. So what he was looking at and observing from and taking his research from is what Don Drake was saying and what he had seen. He felt that they weren't alive, that they had there was no broken rhythm. But that was true, may have been true maybe in the 60s and in the 70s, but it's not true here in the year by the coming of 1980, 1990, 2000, because things evolve. The other thing he took from was Savat. Now, many other writings and many other literature say he did not take from Savat, but I know different. Because I was there when he researched it. I was there when he actually kicked and looked at the super rate of French fighters. If there was a French, I don't know where he even got the tape. There was a French champion in Savat, and he was watching it on super eight and eight millimeter film. And he analyzed it and he said, oh, I like this. This is a very punishing kick. 
coup de bar, which is the kick when they lift up, you know. He says, this is really good. And he liked the way they use their legs because he said, savat people, or box won't say savat, they box with the feet. And that's what he liked. And he liked boxing. So he started to put all these elements together. And then he took the kicks, he thought, from northern system and from southern Chinese systems to see how they work. And that became Jun Fan kickboxing. It fit him. For us, we might have to find another path, but for Bruce Lee, that was the path he chose. Elements of uh, Thai boxing, elements of Savat. And he liked the headbutts of the Burmese boxers. So he incorporated that into his own personal system. And I don't care what anybody writes about in you know, all the books and all the magazine, he did have those elements in it. Many people don't know. They said, well, he only take it mainly from Wing Chun, which is a strong, at that point, had a strong Wing Chun background. But in the kick ranging, he says, you don't use that kind of punching. You have to use attack by combination, what he called ABC. Jun Fan is the base system. It has curriculum in it. It has a definite pattern. Ji Kune Do really is the, it, it stems off of Jun Fan Gung Fu. He wanted you to have the base in Jun Fan Gung Fu. And Ji Kune Do was really Bruce Lee's personal system. And as I tell people before, it can be taught, but you would be losing it if you started to standardize it, because everyone is individual. Things that Bruce Lee did, and this is what people don't realize, what he did, a lot of people can't do. Like he could really shell shock a person with his lead jab. A lot of people can't not. We could score with that. We could put the guy off balance with it. We might even hurt him, but we can't take a man out. He had tremendous power, and we don't have that, you know. He had speed that it flabbergasted me. You know, I was a conference champion in my college, and he used to catch me like I was just in slow motion. It was like a bad dream. I have never met anybody as explosive as him. I've never met anybody as fast as him. And there will be people that will surpass him maybe in speed, but maybe in totality, probably not. Because he's a rare individual, and maybe, probably when God made him, he threw them all away. Intelligent, a lot of fighters, not intelligent, they're just gutsy, but he was gutsy. You know, uh, he was, he knew the direction in which he wanted to do it purposely. He just knew the direction when he was creating this. And it was created for him. But Jun Fan Gung Fu, we have to learn how to take the system and make it for ourselves. <laughs> When Bruce Lee was uh, organizing the kickboxing, he didn't really call it kickboxing in the beginning. But he says, we're going to run a kick, and our kicking is going to be like a boxer. At that time, he felt that a lot of systems, they slugged with the foot. He says, you want to fence with your foot. You want to box like with your feet like a boxer. You don't want to use it. So almost 80% of his strikes were with the front leg and the front hand. Because he felt if you were right-handed, that's your most powerful punch. If you're right-legged, that's most powerful kick. And since the left hand was weaker, he would put the left hand back for more power. And because in boxing, he analyzed it that the, that the jab scored so frequently but could not put the person out of commission. It just added, a lot, added up a lot of points. So that's why he put the left hand back for more power and he felt if you put the strongest hand forward at that time, okay, whether you're right-handed or left-handed, then it's going to be more powerful. And for him, it worked beautifully because he had the power. He worked on it. His three-inch punch was phenomenal. Very few people, pound for pound, I think he punches. He's like the hardest puncher you would ever meet. You know, He's like a miniature uh, Marciano. He's, you might look at his boxing form and you'll say, well, that's not maybe the most polished boxing form you see. He would be like a, a Marciano, a, a miniature Marciano or a miniature Frazier, you know. 
And uh, although he had admired Muhammad Ali because he liked the left hand to score frequently, that's why sometimes he would drop his lead. Sometimes people say, "No, that's he's dropping his um, Muhammad Ali." He dropped his lead, and that's what Bruce Lee did. He dropped his right lead because he said the jab coming up is hard to see, and this is some of the reason why he developed it. And his kicking was like fencing and boxing. He wanted to score frequently, and make it very, very sophisticated. Thank you very much. And Bruce Lee drew from Western sources. Don't let anyone fool you. It has a Chinese name, but he drew from both East and West. And I know this. Although people say in writing, and I don't care how many books are written, they weren't there. They don't know. And that's all I'm going to say about it. You know, when we first started off in the trapping, that was emphasized, like when I started with him in 1964. I started with him right after the first international karate championships that Ed Parker threw. And I was a student and a black learner, Ed Parker. I was so fascinated with Bruce Lee. And at that time, he stressed a lot of hand trapping, which comes from Wing Chun. And as the years evolve, instead of coming off of a Wing Chun structure, before he used to do a Wing Chun structure and then go into a boxing structure, but as the years evolved, he took the trapping that came off of a kickboxing mode. In other words, a kickboxing mode would be like almost, I would say, savant, kind of a mixture between savant and Muay Thai and northern Chinese systems of kicking with Western boxing. That was the mode. And the trapping came off that. It, it wasn't that the Wing Chun trapping was bad, like the straight blast was good, the trapping was good. It's that he knew there was a time and a place to trap. If you have room, you can do the kickboxing. When you're in tight, he felt the trapping was good, and he was very good. And he was very good at what I call first motion. One trap, one hit, he could put you away. Many times I've seen him. He, he's, I think that, uh, I think I'm safe in saying I've been knocked down by Bruce Lee more than any human being on earth. And I know that he could shell shock your body with one shot, one trap, either to the body, to the solar plexus because he liked me. Of course, he didn't shell shock my face as much, but it was to the body. And when he hit the body, he could knock the wind off. He had that much power, and he had the short range trapping. But that was mixed with Western boxing. In other words, he would come in, trap, go into sort of like Wing Chun hands, and then come out with Western boxing hands, or come out into a, a single leg tackle, or a double leg tackle, or a leg pickup, or go to the rear and dump you. In the trapping of Bruce Lee, in the beginning, as I said before, it was mainly Wing Chun trapping. He got out of that a little bit. He, he used to trap and he would straight blast. And after he would straight blast, he would go to things like overarm hook, underarm hook, body tackle, which is a form of trapping. If you control the shoulder, you control the elbow, that is a form of trapping. So what he did was mix that with the Wing Chun trapping. Uh, probably a uh, person who grapples will look at it and say, well, no, they might not understand the Wing Chun portion. A Wing Chun portion would can't, but probably not understand uh, why he would go into trapping the arms, trapping the elbow, trapping the head, trapping the body, trapping the legs, okay? What he called hand immobilizing tag, H-I-A. Then there is F-I-A, foot or leg immobilizing, because you can grab, you can control the body, a good wrestler will trap the body. He is being trapped on the ground or in the standing position. You can trap and hold. So he liked to go between the Wing Chun trapping and he would go into other areas that he had learned from or, or rest and wrestling that he researched and from maybe observing Sambo. We don't know exactly, and, and I myself, to be really honest, I don't know how he integrated it. But I know that it wasn't the regular Wing Chun, because when I went back and studied with other Wing Chun people, and that's a great style, Wing Chun. It is a great style. But there's a time and place. Sealot, I know his involvement, because he was the first one who bought me all my Sealot books. 
we used to go to a bookstore and he said, buy that book, that book. He had uh, a great fascination for learning different arts. And with Sealot, he felt a person in Sealot, Sealot was a uh, tremendous condition. He was a well-conditioned athlete to go through their their uh, forms, what they call Kenbango and Juros, both the fighting forms and the, and the what we call the artistic forms. He knew that the people, and many people uh, say that he never researched that particular art, but I say he did. How much? I don't know. But I know that he did research it. Wing Chun, as I told you before, it's a great system. And Bruce Lee, really, many people don't know this, and many people do, he didn't really complete the Wing Chun. Like the dummy, it was only up to section number seven. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So that's why when I learned it, I only learned it up to, the, up to section seven. So he created his own move. He freelanced on the dummy. It's not completed. But as a great fighter, he was a great fighter. And he used elements of the Wing Chun. I have an uh, instructor named uh, Sifu Hawkins Chung, who's my Wing Chun instructor. And he said something to me that I thought was very interesting. He said, the first generation of people of Yip Man were fighters. The second generation were technician. And the third generation, he felt they lived off the reputation of the first generation and the second generation. He told me that Bruce Lee second and third and fourth hand, he could never tell if it was efficient enough. He says, but he knew Bruce Lee's first hand and first motion would blow people away. Therefore, no one knew what his level was in the second and third hand or, or the, the exchange. And I think that's a good thing because as I remember, Bruce Lee would blow away people on the first strike and on the first hit, which made a difference. I'm sure you can find a lot of great Wing Chun people out there, and as far as knowing the system of Wing Chun, they probably excel over Bruce Lee, you know. But what he did was take the essence of Wing Chun and make it work for you. That's what he said, take the essence. Because some people, let's use it this way so you can understand it, okay? Some people do not have a BA degree. They do not have a BS degree. They do not have a master's degree, MA, MS. They don't have a doctor's degree. But even though they don't have the title sometimes of an educated man, they are highly educated. People say, well, he's only, he only has a master's, only, only has a bachelor's. But because if he studied, is so much studying, they have the same caliber of a guy that has a PhD. He, they just didn't have the time to have a, a university or a college recognize the level he was at. Bruce Lee was that kind of type of a martial artist. He's at what I call a PhD level in understanding it. But maybe sometimes, in other words, for me, sometimes you don't have to be a tenth and a ninth or an eighth or a seventh degree in a particular style of system. You know, maybe you're just a first, but you haven't been recognized or you didn't go through the system to attain that recognition. And Bruce Lee, because he was evolving, constantly evolving, many people from many different systems, black belt and other systems, studied with him or wanted to study with him. Some didn't want to study with him because, you know, it might jeopardize their, their uh, reputation. They didn't want people to know. Others didn't want to do it because they wanted to, but they were embarrassed to train under a person that possibly does not hold rank in any system, yet you find all these people with ranking following this man, fifth, sixth degree, who befriended him because they knew he had the talent, he knew that he had the knowledge. You know, uh, Bruce Lee used to say, uh, sticking to the nucleus, know the nucleus, follow the nucleus, dissolve the nucleus. In other words, he said, know the principle, follow the principle, and dissolve the principle. This is the way you use. So, a lot of times people say, well, how come uh, the stress in Chi Zhao was taken out? It wasn't that it was taken, taken out, it's that he used it to get to a certain level. And by going to that middle level, but he says, it's not, that's not the whole bag of wax, so as they say, it, because the trapping in the, in the Chi Zhao is one level. 
Now, when you liberate it and you go to distance, when a guy is striking and hitting you and double leg tackling and single leg tackling you and grabbing your clothing like a kimono or a gi, it, it might change the structure. So you got to know how to use that structure of sensitivity and trapping. But he felt it was important to learn. Not that he didn't think it was important, she's on anymore. He went through it and got that essence so that he could take it and put it in a different structure. So it's important that you can take material out and put it in another material. In other words, let me just put it this way. You know the value of a tank. It will work in certain type of terrains. It will not work in a terrain like the Amazon jungle. Take a tank, it's only stopped because too much vegetation. It will not work in the ocean. It will not work in mountainous region with a lot of trees, but it will work in plains where there's level fields. So you gotta know the value of that. So like cheese out, it works under a certain environment and structure. And it's a good environment and structure. A good Wing Chun man can make it work in many structures. But for Bruce Lee, it was, he wanted to take the essence of Chi Zhao and put it into his structure. The structure had to be mobile. You have to strike him at different angles. You have to be ready. Because a lot of times the play is up here in the top. The minute the person sinks like a, a single leg tackle, double leg tackle, Sometimes now the, the cheese out has uh, doesn't have the capacity to deal with it. Now, if it's up here and there's a, it's a crowd of people, right? The, the hand structure, then the cheese out movements will work. You have to know how to use it. This is like any infantry soldier. There's a time to use the rifle. There's a time to use the handgun. There's a time to use the grenade. The grenade. There's a time to call for the artillery, there's a time to call for an airstrike, there's a time for everything, there's a time to fix bayonets. It's not that 100% you're always going to use your rifle. 100% you're not always going to use a grenade, 100% you're not always going to use fixed bayonets, right? So you have to know how to use it. And a lot of times you have to call for an airstrike for support. So everything has its place. It's neither better nor worse. So cheese out is important I think you know and also uh, just learning how to deal like a wrestler does plumbing and moving in for the neck and arm like that's important too because that's a different type of structure all structures would be out to save you to jump in a swimming pool the kicking is out the sensitivity is a little bit different now see it's different you see put two people in five feet of water to fight to put people and make them fight in six feet of water. The structure is different. Another type of structure has to come in place. So you have to look at the environment. But I still think it's a practical form. Myself, if I was a person interested in uh, getting better in the martial art, I would study under a good Wing Chun teacher. Because I do think it's important. I would study under a, a wrestler because I do believe they're in highly conditioned. They know how to understand sensitivity from another fact. I would study a Filipino martial art and study things like the Hubud, things of that sort, because it's only going to make you well-rounded. Going back to the trapping, the trapping led to the grappling, and I think that's important for people to know that. You know, A lot of people said there was no grappling, and it was true, because at that time, they didn't grapple and contest it. They just trapped, straight blast, took the guy down, and then that would be it. We did a lot of things in our own personal training that were not taught in the Chinatown school. And that's because he was experimenting. And that's because he was researching. He loved the research. He loved to experiment. And when he researched and experienced, he would create. And that's why I would say that the curriculum of Jun Fan Gong Fu, which is a set and established system, and Ji Kune Do, which is his own personal system, was constantly evolving because he was constantly evolving. And if you stop, just like in any field of endeavor, there is research, there's experimentation, there's creativity, and there is an evolution that is taking place, a gradual evolution that's so subtle sometimes you don't even realize that it's evolving. And that's what made him great. When we talk about the grappling in Jeet Kune Do, 
or in John Fang Kung Fu, he really didn't teach it at the Chinatown school. And that's because he was still researching it. What he used to do is research on my body. But if I were to organize it, I would say that he, a lot of his finger locking and a lot of his locks came from Professor Wally J. A lot of his takedowns probably came from judo and wrestling because he liked the single leg takedown, he liked the double leg takedown, simple things. He picked a couple of judo throws that he really liked because he had judo training. I don't know how, for how long. He liked the Siyonagi. He liked the Kubanagi. He liked the Asotagari. He liked Tai Toshi. Very, very simple, you know. He didn't gravitate to the hip throws like Ogoshi, Yukigoshi, but he liked Uchimata a lot. Right? He liked Tarai Goshi. He liked Hanagoshi. Uh, I would say that I don't know why he didn't uh, incorporate the training, this type of training, but what he did was incorporate it with me. And what we used to do is just go through this movements for, through trapping, through attack by combination, which is more like kickboxing, and then put me in the lock, and we wouldn't contest it. We would just tap. If it hurt, it tapped. We didn't try to get out of it. In other words, we didn't wrestle. However, the newer people now are doing that mainly because of the influence maybe from the movement of Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu in the United States and in shoot wrestling. Shoot wrestling, as you saw, is a combination of Russian Sambo, Japanese Jiu-Jitsu and Judo, mixed with European catch as can wrestling, mixed in with Muay Thai, and then modified to fit it in what we call kick and punch and submit type of arts. But at that time frame, we did not. That's why I encourage my people to train in a variety of arts because possibly I won't be able to give them in depth that maybe some of these arts can do. And I myself train in these arts because I want to grow also. You know? And I would say that uh, a lot of people were saying, well, uh, the most common uh, comment I hear is that, well, Danny Nassano has money the waters of Jeet Kune Do because he teaches other arts. And, but to me... You know, I try to teach Jeet Kune Do and Jun Fang Kung Fu exactly the way Sifu Bruce Lee taught me. However, I love to train in the other arts. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. If you like classical music, you should be able to go into pop. You should be able to go into Western music. You should be able to go into hip hop or whatever you like. I don't know what you like. And I don't think there's anything wrong in, in liking classical music and pop music or Western or jazz or whatever. I think that's... That's a person should be able to do that. But I know I'm criticized for that because people want to just frame me in one particular way. I don't know what the deal is, but I think it's important to grow. And you don't grow unless you go out of the confines of security. It's easy to stay in one system and do it exactly that way. It's a little bit more daring and sometimes kind of fearful to go in areas where you're not familiar or to tread on waters that you're not familiar with. But that's where growth comes. As he said, it's from the old that we get the security. It is from the new that we grow. And I think it's important. In any new situation, you're going to grow. Okay, for the, in Jeet Kune Do, for an example, there are many camps of Jeet Kune Do. Jeet Kune Do has evolved many different ways depending who's teaching it. And I think that's healthy because everyone's going to develop it and, and bring it up differently. There's a camp that want to teach original Jeet Kune Do material as taught by Bruce Lee. But the point of what I want to say about that is the people that sometimes push that, they don't know the entire original material. And even if they did know the entire original material, to hold it in that frame, time frame, and it's good. And the people should study what was taught at that time period and then expand upon it. If you don't expand upon it, you don't grow. People say, well, that's all I have to know is what Bruce Lee taught me in 1964 or 1967 or 1971. Or that's all I need. I've heard that before from many people. To do that is to go against the philosophy 
that against the concepts that Bruce Lee had and against his principles, because that's not what Bruce Lee is all about. All out combat goes, that's what he says, it utilizes, Jeet Kune Do is supposed to utilize many forms. That's why he can fit in with many forms or many methods of systems or styles or whatever you want to call it. You need to to go and be on, in other words, it would be like, okay, I eat Italian food, It's I like it, and it is good, and that's all I'm going to eat. And that's okay too, but you should maybe eat something else beside Italian food, no matter how good it is. I'm, maybe that's a poor analogy, but I believe that you need to... Uh, you know, be more well-rounded than to stay in that time frame. And if you don't, like a lot of people say, well, let's not, uh, let's not uh, expand this. And then there's people, if you want to, they'll say, I'm, uh, I, I study Aikido, I study uh, Jiu Jitsu, I study Karate, I study a Taekwondo. I'll put it together and I'll call it Jeet Kune Do. Is it Jeet Kune Do? It's Jeet Kune Do for them. But it is not the Jeet Kune Do of Bruce Lee. Because the Jeet Kune Do of Bruce Lee has the Jun Fun Gung Fu material in the beginning. And then from there, they're supposed to grow and expand. That is Jeet Kune Do. And it is different for every individual. So I would say that if you did that, put karate and Aikido and Taekwondo and maybe uh, wrestling, that could be your Jeet Kune Do. That's correct. But it is not the Jeet Kune Do as devised or created by Bruce Lee because he when you say you have the John Fon what he thought were the basics important and then expand and find your own G Kune Do you know G Kune Do I, I really don't know what it's going to be like in the future but I will say this okay that everyone will promote it advance it in their own way that they think it's right but I will say that G Kune Do people or John Fon Gung Fu G Kune Do people are usually the most free-minded. In other words, what I mean by that is that they are the, usually the first ones will get into any kind of thing that is new. In other words, they were usually the first ones that got into uh, shoot wrestling. They were usually the first ones that got into Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu. They were the, usually the first one that explored uh, catches can wrestling, Russian Sambo, different things of that nature. So most of them, I say the majority of them, are very open-minded. They're free to go in the path they want. You know, at the time that Bruce Lee uh, was alive, he had uh, three certificates. One was on Jun Fan Gung Fu, and he gave rank one, two, three. That's usually the ranking he gave, reserving eighth as the highest rank. And then he had rank in what he called Chinese Gung Fu, uh, the Dao of Chinese Gung Fu. And then he had rank in what we refer to as Jeet Kune Do. Both the Jeet Kune Do certificate and the Dao of of Chinese Kung Fu, he gave because it said was personally trained by Bruce Lee. I have three certificates. At the time of his lifetime, I was able to give up to my rank. In other words, I was rank three, I could give rank one. We had two, that was broken down into one and two. And one was broken down into what we call senior one, junior one. Two was broken into a junior one and senior, and I was able to give up to those ranks during his lifetime. You know, the minute he died, people said, "No, Bruce Lee didn't give rank. You can't give rank." See, but while he was alive, I could give that. I could test for it if I wanted to, and I could give that rank. So now, here in the year 2000, I give rank, and I've added what we call a uh, apprentice instructor. I had added associate instructor and full instructor and senior full instructor. Apprentice now, starting in 1988, the people who study with me, they have to go five years, no matter how good they are, because I think the time with that same knowledge is a difference. They go anywhere from four to five years as an apprentice instructor. This is after they've already gone three years of learning. They have to have a minimum of three years before I can even, even look at them as an apprentice instructor. And they go another four or five years to get an associate instructor. And then they'll go another four and five years to get, if they finish what they call a full instructor. And I usually keep four or five years to become senior instructor. People say, wow, that's close to 20 years, 23 years. Because that's 
the way I wanted. I wanted a high standard, you know. And we all have strengths and weaknesses. And any time you grade somebody, you, it's objectively and it's objectively. You have to have something objective and you have to have some check It's a gut feeling, you know. Uh, being a full instructor does not mean necessarily mean you're the best fighter. It means you can lead, you can teach, you know the direction and the way that art should go. And I think that's very important. You know, when Bruce Lee died, you know, uh, nobody expect him to die. And at that time, there was only three of us that were instructors. One was Taki Kimura, which is his friend. And he taught in the Seattle area of Washington. The other one was James Lee, who was his friend also, a very dear friend, and he taught in the Oakland area. And the third instructor, I was his third instructor, and I taught in Los Angeles. When I uh, trained under him, we no one knew. So at that time, James Lee, as you know, passed away from cancer. So that left two of us. That was Taki Kimura and myself. I'm very, very close to Taki. I, I had the most utmost respect. He is my senior in Junfang Kung Fu. When he went to Hong Kong, I took over the Los Angeles school. In fact, when it was open, he says, you run it because I don't like to teach. That was his, his saying to me. You teach it. You're the Sifu there. I'll come over to check it out. And that's the way we had it. So when he left from Hong Kong, he says, you are in charge of G. Kendo. That's what he said. You are in charge of G. Kendo. And that's pretty hard because when he passed away, I am not a Bruce Lee and I'm not going to pretend like I'm a Bruce Lee. I don't have his attributes. You know, I have a lot of his teaching. I was there when he researched on many things and he researched with different people. If you had a wrestling background, he would play with you and learn what he could from that. So he was constantly learning things also. So I would say that, yes, it is. The burden of Jeet Kune Do is heavy, you know. And maybe n not one person has the knowledge at all, but I, have a, I feel I have a lot of, of the knowledge that was handed down. I know the direction in which he wanted to. There were people that were students under me that wanted me, two types of students, one that wanted to keep it a very closed-door group. The other one wanted to expand upon them. There are two different factions here now striving. One wants to promote it as a big like Taekwondo. The other group does not want. They just want to have three or four or five in the background. And that's the way Bruce Lee wanted it. However, there were many people, illegitimate people in Jeet Kune Do, already saying that Bruce Lee made them instructors and things of that nature. And with this happening, that forced us to come out and starting to teach Jeet Kune Do because these people, they weren't even close to what Jeet Kune Do was. And it would, you know, a lot of people would be teaching it and they would be teaching karate and calling it Jeet Kune Do. And that's all over the United States because no one can check it, right? They don't have belts in Jeet Kune Do. We have uh, ranking, eight ranks. And even that was put away later on, you know. It was important uh, for him to have ranking. So at that time, uh, level three was considered an instructor. Bruce Lee having the highest, which is eighth rank. In other words, there was a yin-yang symbol that was blank. And then each yin-yang symbol had green, brown, black, yellow, and white, red and white, and then the colors of the deacon. And then the last rank, which is his rank, is a blank circle like the beginner. That's the way he had it. So at that time, he didn't like ranking. Everybody knew that. But it is a burden sometimes, and it's a burden I don't want, you know, because it's, it's a high responsibility. I don't want for once ever to do something that would uh, diminish, I don't think anything can diminish Bruce Lee anyway, because he, what he said is going to be there. Many books have been written about them, good and bad. So I think he's here to stay. You know, everyone knows he is a pioneer in the martial arts. He is, he is like the, the Einstein of the martial art because he could do it. He could perform it, you know. He has uh, inspired so many people in the martial arts, not necessarily in Jeet Kune Do. So he's here to stay. He's a milestone. Nothing we can do will diminish it or make it get better, you know. So you have to go. I have to go with the gut feeling. My gut feeling is this is the way Bruce Lee would have wanted me to go.